episode of MFA Writers. Today's episode on the University of Maryland was requested by Cynthia. Thank you, Cynthia, for reaching out, and I hope you enjoy listening to this conversation with the talented emerging writer Edward Daschle as much as I enjoyed having it. This episode is being released on the last day of January, which means many listeners who are currently enrolled in programs started their spring semester in the two weeks since our previous episode came out. So I just wanted to wish you all good luck, especially those of you entering your thesis semester. Also, best of luck to everyone who applied this cycle. As the decisions start rolling in in the coming weeks, remember that none of us get accepted everywhere. And as was the case with our guest this week, sometimes rejections can lead to even better experiences down the road. You can find MFA Writers on Instagram and Twitter, as well as MFAWriters.com. We love to hear from listeners, so feel free to shoot us a direct message on one of those platforms or an email at MFAWritersPodcast at gmail.com. And if you have a minute to rate or review the show, the best place to do that is on Apple Podcasts. Doing so will help boost our podcast as we try to boost these amazing writers. Also, if you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the show, you can apply at MFAWriters.com. On that same website, you can also click the support button to support us financially, if it's within your means. Or you can do so by going directly to buymeacoffee.com slash MFAWriters. Finally, as always, thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to MFA Writers, the podcast where we talk to creative writing MFA students about their program, their process, and a piece they're working on. I'm your host, Jared McCormick. Today, I'm with Edward Daschle. Edward is a second-year creative writing MFA candidate studying fiction at the University of Maryland. He grew up in the Pacific Northwest, land of serial killers and Sasquatch, deadly mountains and overcast skies. His fiction appears in Grimm and Gilded, Stone Boat Literary Journal, Defunct, and OFIC Magazine. Today, Edwards brought an excerpt from a short story to read for us. Hi, I'm going to be reading um, an excerpt from The Reflections, published in Stone Boat Literary Journal. Uh, this takes place in uh, Denmark. Paul had read online that Ishway Strand was where he could cruise for sex, if that was what he wanted. He'd taken the metro and a train from Van Lusa and then spent the morning at the museum. In one gallery, a cloven cow floated in a tank of blue fluid, and in another, Mural's collage from garbage decorated the walls. A broken wagon wheel in, in particular caught Paul's eye, and he took a selfie with the wheel as his halo. Lunch at the museum was overpriced, though even after half a year in Denmark, it took him a moment to figure out what too expensive meant in Kroner. He still always did a rough conversion back to dollars in his head. But from where he was sitting, he could look out at the water while he ate. Below, blonde families ran from the gray waves breaking into lacy foam. Bunches of stinking seaweed sat in clumps as though bailed. And far beyond, at just about the edge of where Paul could see, a rough-hewn stone jetty cut the beach in two. Past the jetty, there was a vast thicket of scrub, scratchy, hard, and dark. But on the thin stretch between the water and the scrub, naked men on beach towels tiled the fine and pale sand. Paul made his way carefully through the scrub, watching the horizon and his now approximate goal. Occasionally, he saw men stand up, sometimes alone, sometimes in pairs. It was like a harvest of mandrakes revealing themselves to the world. When he reached the water... He hopped down the bank and stood there feeling especially conspicuous, fully clothed as he was and with his backpack making him look more like a hiker than a cruiser. Huad van den Lavardu? Oh, sorry, I don't speak, Paul said in return, though it took him a moment to see the elderly man who had croaked up him from the sand. The man looked like an overturned amphora, flaccid penis and unintentional imperfection in the craftsmanship. Just English. Strip or move along, the man said. Paul moved along. He wasn't about to strip on command and set a president he didn't mean to uphold. He figured he'd find an open space and set himself up there, but either way, he couldn't walk much longer. If he did, he'd end up making a loop of his wanderings and turn back without ever joining in. Some of the men he passed glanced up at him, others appeared to be sleeping. A few were jacking off languidly, but none were actively fucking. That must happen amongst the scrub, Paul thought, in the sandpit clearings where they might find a modicum of privacy. 
Finally, he found a gap where he could lay down his towel. He slipped off his clothes and then lay on his stomach, letting the cloud-filtered light have its way with his shoulders and ass. And soon enough, he began to relax. He realized he hadn't been without any distractions, no music, audiobook, or podcast for ages. Forget fucking, forget the old men who wouldn't satisfy him anyways. He could just lie on the sand in blissful silence, maybe even pass the rest of his life that way. The man who appeared beside Paul was young, he thought, though he didn't look up at first to see, judging instead by the tan toes and smooth nail beds. Sorry, I don't, Paul said when the man began to speak to him in Danish. Do you want some company? The men asked in English without even the light accent Paul had come to expect from Danes, and Paul turned to him. He was already undressed, his towel draped over one shoulder, and Paul let his gaze wander up the man's body, pausing at the lovely and familiar cock. Jesper, the man said casually, introducing himself. But this man wasn't Jesper, he was Caleb. He was blonde, brown-eyed, tall, and pale, but even beyond the superficial, Paul would have been more than certain no matter how he introduced himself that this was Caleb. Even the shape of his penis was the same as Caleb's had been, and the same as his own, because Caleb was Paul's doppelganger. Edward, thanks so much for reading, and thanks for being here. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. Well, you told me before the interview that you mostly write queer literary fiction, the piece you read from would seem to fall into that category, but you told me you also like to write fantasy. So which came first for you, the quote unquote literary fiction or the genre fiction? Oh, absolutely. The genre fiction that came first. I mean, the first story I ever wrote, well, that I really remember writing, of course, um, was a picture book that I submitted to Reading Rainbow. It never appeared on Reading Rainbow, of course. (laughs) Because it was dreadful, but it was about this boy, a prince who runs away from his castle and he, I think he almost gets eaten by a giant, but then he has sleeping powder somehow and he escapes. But so my first ever story was, um, fantasy. And then I've, I wrote fantasy for a very long time and it took me kind of a while before I really discovered literary fiction for myself that I really resonated with mostly in college and then kind of gravitated more towards that. And then it's kind of back influence. And I've try and write kind of more literary fantasy now too, and do both. Oh, well, I have very fond memories of reading rainbow as a kid. Of course. <laughs> I can still see myself like sitting in the school library and watching it on like the TV <laughs> cart that they would roll in <laughs> and play. Um, okay. So, well, you kind of alluded to this just now, but I was curious if these days when you're writing, and you're writing literary fiction. Is it either or literary fiction or fantasy? Or do you find the two bleeding into one another? Or are you trying to like combine the two? Oh, they absolutely bleed into each other when I write. I mean, this story, for example, it has this doppelganger feature, but so much of it is about the character kind of not knowing. Um, and that kind of being part of the trauma of the experience of having this doppelganger where he doesn't know, is a doppelganger? Am I just sort of a gay who's kind of, you know, in love with a guy who looks like me, which is a very common like queer experience that is heavily remarked upon. Um, but then I have another story I just wrote, which is also kind of about a woman who's reflecting on a time when she was a child and she went into a fantasy world um, where there's also the question of, did this happen? Did it not happen? And I love exploring those gaps. Um, but then also more recently, I guess, actually, I was revising a story and I took out the fantasy because I realized the fantasy wasn't central to the story and it was more of a distraction than than anything else so it's yeah it's definitely constant like back and forth and so you said you started with writing the genre writing the fantasy what motivated you to move towards the literary fiction side of things yeah it was absolutely just the writers i began to read more of because Mm -hmm. when i was a kid i really only read fantasy for so long i always loved fantasy i mean it took me a while it took me a while to fall in love with reading but then when i did it was all fantasy all the time and then it was really more into college that i developed a deeper passion for literature i liked english classes in high school but then college i kind of expanded so much. I read James Baldwin in my first class in college, and he was the first literary fiction I'd read with a a gay character in it, which was really important for my development. But then I also read Haruki Murakami that year as well. And so kind of those two. And then later I read Kazuo Ishiguro, and I was just like, wow, there is so much really good stuff here. And I was like, I love this so much. I love the way it makes me feel. I love the way it encapsulates so much 
experience. And I want to do that. And so I tried to explore how I could do that more. And so now I have influences from all over the place, like Brian Washington and Garth Greenwell, um, as far as queer authors go, or uh, Brandon Taylor. I I love the fact that some of these boundaries between genres and between literary and genre have been kind of broken down over recent years. It really seems like there's more openness to allowing these genre elements into literary fiction. I mean, I, I can remember not that long ago where it seemed like if you weren't writing strict literary fiction, right? Like you, you couldn't get into an MFA program or you couldn't like get published, but that's not really the case anymore, is it? Yeah, no, I've definitely seen this change too. I mean, that was so much of an anxiety of mine when I was, when I applied like the first round, I was so certain that I couldn't submit anything fantasy based, um, to get into a program. But, um, when I got into this program, I submitted a story that was very much a science fiction story. Um, but it, yeah, it's been so fascinating to see the industry change, to see kind of what's respected and what's appreciated change so much. Like, for yeah. example, one of my favorite authors, Carmen Maria Machado, um, her story Husband Stitch was like basically a viral story. Um, and it's everyone loves it. And it has all these really deep fantasy and horror elements to it, but also, you know, really intense look into some serious issues. Yeah, that's an amazing story. If listeners haven't read it, I would go do that right now. It's such a good (laughs) one. Um, And so now that you're in the MFA program, do you feel like you're supported in wanting to explore those genre elements? Oh, absolutely. It actually has become kind of a joke in our program that uh, you come in writing, you know, realism you come in writing literary realism and then you leave writing fantasy because at this point in in my time we've all written i think mostly fantasy now which is so funny um even one person in my cohort um was writing really more real realism um and then ended up going to clarion west this last summer which is so cool and now and we're all writing so much fantasy um in this program but then the faculty too are really encouraging of it um last last year one of the faculty who's now my thesis advisor uh taught a course which is about speculative fiction about kind of the fantastic and kind of genre fiction in general and so there is definitely a lot of encouragement to write anything and write whatever most appeals to you. And we'll discuss it. We'll critique it. We'll give you feedback to make this work work, which is so wonderful. I I think that's, that's the thing that like, I don't hear people talk about a lot, but in my experience, and I've heard from other people as well, that like the cohort that you're working with often can have a real influence on the work that starts being produced in the program. Like if, if somebody in your program is really pushing boundaries and it's working and it resonates with other people, suddenly the other people in the cohort feel the freedom to like try those new things in their own work. Sometimes, you know, it can move in like a fantasy direction like you're talking about or um, in a different genre direction based on what other people in the program are writing. Yeah, no, I mean, it's so wonderful because in my, in my cohort, it's so tiny. There's only three of us in my year because mm-hmm. um, University of Maryland is a really small program. But in my year, there's the three of us. One of us, uh, <laughs> I'm saying us as though I'm kind of speaking for all of us, but I kind <laughs> of am in a way. Um, I do that sometimes. But one of us writes kind of this really beautifully descriptive kind of a lot of discussions of food kind of comes up a lot. And it's so wonderful. And I've I don't think I can, I don't think that's really what I can do. Like my relation to food is obviously very different, but it inspired me to also kind of like try and bring up those kind of evocations of like beautiful descriptions of beautiful sensations. Um, and then, like I said, the other one, he's writing just these really interesting, really intense stories, um, but also experimenting a lot too. And that's inspired me. So it's just really great to like find this inspiration from people who are kind of in a very similar place to me like in my, in our writing lives. I mean, I I think we talk a lot about the importance of a cohort being um, supportive and finding like lifelong writing friendships and getting along, but it's also really nice. And I think important to have people who push you to try new things, who inspire you to try new things. So um, that's cool that you've found that at the university of Maryland. I want to talk a little bit more about your individual writing process Let's start with how you come up with ideas for pieces. Are you mining your own lived experience for material or do you try to stay away from that when writing fiction? 
I have, yeah, no, I'm constantly mining my own experience experiences um, for my writing. It's constantly pulling things out and seeing what works. I, I don't really want to write, you know, just precisely what happened. Um, I'm not, autofiction is not really kind of where my mind goes when I write. Um, I've read some really good autofiction, like Edouard Louis, the French writer, um, who, who's this really intense kind of autofiction. For me, I, I want to use my experiences, but I want to transform them pretty significantly. So I'm finding something really new and um, resonant to me because that's just kind of how it works for me. But I definitely am always minding my experiences. I'm just like, sometimes I've even gone into things being like, I don't know if I want to do this, but at the same point, even if it's not great, I can maybe write about it later, which has honestly gotten me a few a few different things, including um, the story in OFIC kind of comes from an experience like that, where I was like, I don't know if I want to go into this, but at the same point, like, you know, cool. I have a story out of this. Yeah. So yeah, definitely all the time. And then I think if there's boundaries, I don't know. I feel like I wouldn't want to like do any, like write anything that's going to hurt anybody, like make anyone feel miserable. But I feel like so much of my work is just trans, so transformative, like from my, from any experience I've had that if you recognize yourself in, in my writing, I don't want to say you're a narcissist, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's, it's not, it's not anyone. It's not anyone in particular. I might've taken like an aspect from an experience I had or like from a relationship, uh, like a friendship or something that I've, I've had and maybe used some characteristics in a way, but like I've never just directly written in someone into a story. Yeah. I think this is one of the reasons why I long ago gravitated towards fiction as opposed to nonfiction. I spent yeah. some time <laughs> writing nonfiction, but I just found I couldn't deal with the idea of just like putting real people down on the page and then having them read it later and knowing that it's them or, or like the vulnerability that comes with telling a story just, to the world straight up, this is what happened to me. I have a lot of respect for nonfiction uh, writers, for, for essayists. But with fiction, I love being able to start with something that's inspired by a real life event. And then and then watching how by the end, by the time I've revised, by the time the story is quote unquote finished, it's like completely unrecognizable. Oh, no, totally. Like so many of my stories start with maybe even a scene like that's pretty directly like, oh, I very much like witness this or experience this. Like not necessarily a character, but like a scene, like this is like, or I'll describe a very particular building or something. Mm -hmm. But then of course, by the end of the story, it's something completely different. Like I've never had a doppelganger. Like, <laughs> okay. There's been people who've looked like me because sometimes I'm like, I'm like, Oh, I don't, I look kind of generic, you know, in a way. And I've had friends who told me they've seen someone who looks a lot like me, but I've never like had like straight up doppelganger where I've had the experience with. Um, but yeah, I just love the experience of kind of starting somewhere not really knowing where it takes you and then delving into that more deeply, even though I tend to kind of outline things, I really love having an outline and being able to follow that. I still love having like surprises come up for me and like unexpected kind of coincidences in the story. I'm like, Oh, I didn't even plan to put that in there, but now it's coming out. That's really great. Yeah. It's really fun to see. And of course, none of that happens if I don't write, which is always the hard part. You know, it's like <laughs> you have to write to like, write, Which sometimes it's really hard. So sometimes it's hard to just sit down and just like do it, but you can plot forever. And then you're still never going to have that experience of finding those like miraculous little things come out if you don't actually do the writing. I think most writers have struggled with motivation at one point or another. How do you overcome that when you feel like you just don't, you don't feel like writing? That is really hard. Um, for a long time, especially like between college and this program, I had like a long period where I was really having trouble with that. I really wasn't writing that much. It was a lot of, you know, partly the imposter syndrome that everyone gets, partly the uh, who wants to read what I'm writing, partly the, you know, just like not doing much with it. I was like, where, what am I doing in my life? I'm in my 20s. Like, what do I do? Um, but I found that having deadlines really helps. So being in the program, of course, really helps. But then more recently, I found that just really any deadline kind of helps, like self-imposed, but with some external factor to it really helps for me. So like choosing a literary magazine that has a submission deadline, I mean, like, oh, I want to write towards that. That is my deadline. It is self-imposed, but at the same time, it's based on something that's outside of me. Right. So I have a bit of accountability to something beyond myself, because if it's just me, I'm like, oh, he's a pushover. Edward, that guy, I can just, I don't have to listen to him. I can just <laughs> ignore that deadline if it's just self-imposed. But if it's like, oh, 
Granta has a deadline. Oh, it's Granta. Okay. So I should definitely, you know, like write to that. I definitely need to submit to that. So having deadlines is really helpful to me and just reminding myself that once you get started, it's actually fun. Like you do this because you do enjoy it. Like it's kind of the, the push beyond that, like pushing out of equilibrium. Is that what it is? I don't know physics, but, (laughs) but, you know, getting, getting to that point where you're already moving once you're moving, Well, for me, once I'm moving, it's it's much easier to keep going. I can I enjoy that process, but getting started is always so hard. Um, so I don't really have a lot of tips for that, but just like finding those deadlines is really useful. Yeah, I think the working towards a literary mag deadline is a great suggestion. So, do you have kind of a set writing routine? Like, do you try to write daily, or do you do you write in the mornings and the evenings? Like, what's your routine usually look like? I do not have a routine <laughs> like at all. It's it's I've always wanted to establish routine. I feel like I'm definitely more productive in the mornings than the evenings. Um because I'm not like fully a morning morning person, but like an early morning person, but I'm definitely more productive in the morning. So I try to get stuff I try and like write stuff in the morning because I know that I'll be less distracted then than in the evening. Cause in the evening when I'm kind of getting ready for bed or whatever, I'm like, Oh, I can maybe just get a bit of writing done and I'll get on my computer and I won't um, yeah. get anything done yeah. because I'll be tired and I'll be preparing for bed. I'll like get shocked by video. And then all of a sudden that's it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I guess my only routine is kind of just close out of everything and then just have that one story open because anything open in the background is going to distract me. I get distracted so easily. So yeah. everyone does, but you know, still, so once you have that idea and you you sit down and you've motivated yourself to start writing, to start drafting that story, are you the type of person who tends to get the story out more or less in the first go? Or does the story change a lot for you during revision? Oh, the story changes constantly in revision. A story I was working on had this fantasy element. I mentioned it. And it actually started from this fantasy element. It started from this concept I had for this fantastical kind of thing, very much sort of in the magical realism territory or inspired by magical realist texts anyways. Um, And I was writing it and this other kind of element to it came up as I was writing it, a relationship between these two other characters. And I was really invested in that. And I was like, I can make this work. This and all fit together. And I had a draft of it. I even like put it through workshop and I got workshop on it, got critique on it. And then just like last month I was revising it and I was thinking, I don't know if I really need the fantasy part to it. I think the fantasy is actually turning out to be a distraction here. Um, and so I took it out and I only lost like two pages out of like 12, which I'm like, oh, that's not great. Like if if I only lost like two pages and it wasn't essential, then maybe it was never essential um, to this story. And so now I have a like, the story is pretty much the same. It's really more just focused on the relationship and the and the character kind of being a temp worker and stuff. Uh and the fantasy I now want to use in a different thing and really focus more on that. But no, absolutely a change because it started in one, it started in a concept and now the concept is not even in the story anymore. So very much it changed from, uh, from the start to the finish. Yeah. My stories tend to change a lot over the course of drafting and revising. And that's one thing that I like to keep in mind. I like to remind myself of this and this helps for me with motivation because I find Um, when I lack motivation, it's often because I feel like the point that I'm at in a story, it feels like work, you know, like, Mm. and often that kind of creeps into my mind during the drafting process when I'm writing a first draft and I start to think, oh, I have to get this perfect the first time through. And that really feels like so much pressure that I don't even want to write in those situations. But if I remind myself, hey, you know, like the first draft, it's just a draft that I need to get out. It's going to change so much in revision. Like my partner often says, first drafts don't have to be perfect. They just have to be written. And I try to remember that when I'm working on my creative work, just get the first draft out and just get into that discovery state of mind. And then in revision, it's going to change quite a bit anyway. Yeah, that is super helpful advice. That is advice I've heard before too. And I cling to, um, because yeah, so many of my stories, if I had to turn in a rough draft or something, uh, to like, if I just had to submit every rough draft, I submitted, if that was what we were going to be published, I don't know if I could be a writer. Like I couldn't do, I, I would be, it wouldn't be, I wouldn't be a published writer anyways, because it would just be too bad. 
Um, I think there's only been one story where I've written it as a rough draft. And I was like, okay, this is pretty much where I want it to be. And there was very little I felt like I really needed to do to go back into it. And that was surprising. That never happens to me. That was a one-time thing. And I like would love to be able to recapture that moment of writing this thing down and having it come out how I wanted to come out. But for the most part, no, it goes through so many revisions. Pretty much, I never stop revising. It kind of like never ends. And even, even like I think the stories I've had published... I actually revised them since submitting them to to the publication because I was like, oh, I don't know if I'll be accepted. And so I came back to it like, you know, because it takes months for it to get back to you. And so by the time they get back to you, you've had enough time to sit in it, rest on it. Yeah. And so I came back to it. I was like, oh, I'll just tweak a little thing here and there. And all of a sudden I've done a revision on it. And then I got the acceptance and I was like, oh. That's that's interesting. That's interesting. Uh, you've you've accepted this previous previous version of it, which is great because I did like it enough to submit it. Sure. Even though now I have a different version of it, which is always really um, interesting to me. So yeah, the revision like never ends for me, which is hard. I'm the same way. I, one of my favorite parts about getting published is that I don't have to work on the story anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Once it's published, yeah. it's done. But like, there are stories that I wrote you know, in my first semester in the MFA program, which was now like three years ago that I thought were completely finished at the time. And, and, you know, I'll return to them now and realize, oh, they're not done. Like I've learned so much in that time that like, there's still more to revise. It's still, the story can still get better. And so, you know, it's just a never ending process really. So how much has your process changed since joining the MFA program? I mean, I've definitely become way more productive since I've gotten here. Um, Like I mentioned, I was having a kind of hard time just staying really focused on my writing through my 20s. I was doing kind of everything in writing that wasn't writing, you know, like a lot of the planning, a lot of the plotting, the outlining, the creating characters, the creating settings, ideas were coming. And I would even start writing. I even write a few hundred words or a few pages into a story but then I would have been there because I was like, this isn't going to be perfect. I don't know if I can finish this or like, what do I do with this anyways? Um, so that was, so my process was pretty much just like not finishing anything. So it wasn't even a process. It was just sort of, I want to be a writer, but I'm not finishing anything. I'm doing everything but the writing. And then when I've gotten here, I've really refocused myself on how do I finish things? How do I finish my stories? How do I start them and then finish them? Because it's so discouraging writing and then not having anything to show for it. even you put, you can put in so much time, you can put in so much writing actually and still not finish something. And so I've refocused myself on just getting something done, even if I don't initially like it, like that, that piece of advice, it's always great. You just got to finish it. Um, and that's really something I've refocused on for my own writing. Cause so many of my drafts, they start from something where I'm like, Oh, I don't, I don't think I even like this, but then I'll go back through it and I'll be like, Oh, actually there's this really cool sentence here. I kind of like this or I like, I actually kind of like the plot and I just need to beef up this element of it or I like this character and maybe this should be the protagonist or something or something like that. But just really focusing on how do I just finish it? So it's not so much, I guess, a process change as in, as it is so much a rethinking of how I think about my own writing, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know the application process wasn't a walk in the park for you. You applied several times before getting in. So do you mind telling us about that experience and what motivated you to keep trying? Yeah. So I applied five different years uh, to the MFA program, which is a lot of applications. It's a lot of time. I got very good at filling out um, all those little <laughs> boxes that they have you fill out on all those application forms. All that time I did avoid the GRE, so I never had to take the GRE, which is great. So I didn't have to study any math. I don't know any math anymore and I didn't have to relearn it. But what kind of kept me motivated was just, I kept asking myself, do I still want this? And I was like, yes, I still want to do this. I really still want to do this. And I was only applying to fully funded programs. So I knew once I got in, you know, it would be fully funded. I wouldn't necessarily have to worry about that aspect of it. And I guess I didn't, you know, understand the economic principle of lost cost fallacy or whatever, or some cost fallacy. Yeah. I didn't understand the economic, you know, processes behind that, you know, cost sunk fallacy is kind of like, if you put money in, you have to keep going to make it worth it. And that's like, not true. <laughs> I didn't understand that. So I kept going. Um, 
but also I would took inspiration from a lot of different places of people who didn't give up. Like I used to watch RuPaul's Drag Race a lot more than I do now. Um, it's gone on very long now. It's very impressive. But there would be these drag queens who had gotten on after playing like for a decade almost, like, you know, eight times or something. And they're very talented drag queens. They've applied so many times. And I was like, wait, I, I can just keep applying. Yeah. Like there's nothing to stop me from just, I mean, besides the cost, but besides that, there's like not a whole lot to stop me from just kind of continuing to go for what I want. Um, if this is still something I want. And I knew that MFA program for me would be a really valuable experience because I know having, I know from college, having a writing community is really valuable to me. Having uh, people I can critique with, people I can write alongside. And in college, I only got a taste of that. I only took, a, I took a few workshops. I took quite a few, but still not a whole lot. And so I knew I wanted more time to be in that kind of space. Um, so I knew it'd be a really valuable experience to me because obviously you don't, need any degree to write. Um, and that was kind of one of the hardest parts about continuing was just the knowledge of, well, you don't need this. So can you really do it? Can you really keep applying if you don't need this? But I, I just kept reminding myself, it's not so much of, do I need this or do I not need this? It's, do I want this? Is this still worth it to me to apply? And so I did keep applying and there were a few years where I probably shouldn't have applied because my applications definitely weren't ready. My writing was kind of in a not a great place based on where I was. But by the time I did get in, I feel like I felt like I was very much ready for the program. And I'm glad I got in when I got in um, for so many different reasons. Well, it's a good lesson on perseverance and a useful one, I think, in this industry where there's just a lot of rejection that we all have to deal with sending work out. And I always say that from my point of view, the common denominator of everyone who has quote unquote made it as a writer is perseverance. Just keep writing, keep sending stuff out. And, you know, eventually um, you'll get those acceptances. So you ended up in the end at the University of Maryland's MFA program, which is a three year fully funded program with tracks in fiction and poetry. As you mentioned earlier, the program only accepts three students in each genre each year. So congrats on getting in. It's a small program. Yeah, no, that was, it was very exciting. I, I got waitlisted first. Um, and then, and they called me actually, Lindsay, I think was the one who called me and she was on the podcast yeah. previously. Um, but she had, she called and she was like, Oh, you're on top of the waitlist. And so I was like, fantastic. That's really great news. It's by the same <laughs> point, I was so nervous and it took like yeah. another month for me to find out that I got in. Um, and it was, it was such, it was so great because I had obviously been trying for so long and I wanted to get in. Um, and then the University of Maryland was is a really great school because, for one, when I was applying, one of the main things I was looking for, I wanted to be fully funded because I wanted to be in a place where once I left the program, I wouldn't have to worry a huge amount about debt. Because if you're worrying about debt, like how can you really focus on other aspects? I knew I would have a trouble with that. Um, I'm sure other people wouldn't would have a different experience. But I know for me, if I were thinking about the debt all the time, that would really influence a lot of decisions I would then have to make after the program. And so I knew I wanted to go into a place where once I left the program, I could continue focusing on my writing um, as much as possible. But then the other reason I really liked Maryland as an option was its proximity to DC. I have some family in DC. And so that was nice. I knew the city. I knew this part of the country a little, at least a little bit. Um, so there was some familiarity there. And then the faculty too, that's something you don't know about when you apply. You ha you can only, you don't really know if they're going to be good professors. Like you, you can read their writing and you can see, oh, I really like their writing. And I did like my professor's writing because I read some of their stuff um, before I got in and I knew I liked it. But then when you get in, that's when you get to see if are they good teachers or not. Sure. And I've been very lucky in that, in that I've had really good professors and I really um, enjoyed um, being in their classes. But that's something you don't really know. And so you always just try and do your best. You can do all your research. You can read all their, you can read all their books. You can read all their stories, but you don't know really how good they are as teachers until you get here. Yeah. So that's always the kind of scary part about it. So on top of the fact that it's a small program with only six students accepted per year, you applied during the height of the pandemic and started the program with several COVID related precautions still in place. Was it difficult to settle in and find community under those circumstances? It was a bit of a mix. And actually the previous year, their whole first year, they had to spend 
taking class on Zoom. So they had to workshop on Zoom. They had to do all that kind of stuff. So I was very glad I got in when I did um, because we were able to meet in person. We were able to go to class in person. We were we wore masks all the time and we're still wearing masks most of the time in classes. But I was able to meet in person and that was just that's really valuable to me um, to be able to do that because you gain such a much stronger bond and connection through that experience of being able to meet people in person. I mean, cause zoom is such a great thing. Like having those technologies that allow you to meet, even when you can't meet in person is really valuable. And it allows a lot of these things to function that in the past wouldn't have been able to function. But when I got there, I was just so glad that we were able to meet in person, even with a truncated, I guess, social schedule. So for example, there were a few things we weren't able to do. Like sometimes the faculty would have students over for like dinners and everyone would kind of gather and have a nice time together. And that's what happened actually at the beginning of this year. It didn't happen last year, but it happened at the beginning of this year. I missed it because I got COVID, oh. go figure. But um, <laughs> but everyone else who went had a really nice time um, kind of having that experience of coming together. And so we didn't have some of that, but then we were still able, still able to do a lot of other things. So it was kind of mixed, but for the most part, I think the program handled it really well for such a chaotic, insane thing. Yeah. And we already talked a bit about the surprising support you've received when writing genre fiction. In general, have you felt that the cohort is pretty supportive of each other? Oh, absolutely. Um, it is a really small cohort. Um, because there's right now there's two third years because the third year is optional. And so one of um, one of them graduated. So there's eight of us, but in workshop, there's only six of us. There's the three first years, the three second years, um, because the third years are working on their theses and then they're also uh, teaching. Um, so really small in workshop, but in workshop, it's really supportive. I always feel like if I submit something, no matter what, I will get really good feedback, really useful feedback. That's not going to tear me down. Like, even if I think, Oh, this is kind of rough. Uh, this is still kind of a weird place. I'm just not really sure what else to do with it. I know I'm still going to get useful, helpful feedback. But then outside of class two, I feel like we've developed like some really good friendships as well. We hang out, we like have lunch together. We just kind of see each other. And then actually I'm living in the same house with another one of my cohort. I feel like it's, it's hard to overstate how useful that is and how wonderful it is to have people, you know, you can rely on emotionally, socially, because, you know, I, I've, I've worked at like temp jobs. I've worked at other places where that hasn't necessarily been the case. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's just, it makes it so much worse. Like I've had jobs where I love everyone I'm working with. I used to work at a climbing gym. I loved everyone work I'm, I was working with and we're still in contact. Um, it's really hard to overstate how important that is. Um, cause you, cause so much writing is done, you know, in isolation, in just your own mind and your own thoughts and your own space. But at the same time, most people do need that that kind of that bond. Yeah, it makes a huge difference, I think. And then you mentioned that the faculty, you really respect their writing and their teaching. I saw on the website that the, the program claims to use a workshop process that decenters whiteness and amplifies BIPOC voices. Have you found the professors to be pretty flexible and open to new ideas in workshop? Oh, absolutely. And actually... Pretty much every workshop we've done has kind of used a slightly different format. Each faculty has kind of chosen a slightly different format to make workshop work for everybody. Um, and it's kind of an experimental thing. And each workshop has kind of pushed us in different ways and kind of allowed us to critique each other in different ways. So it's really been interesting seeing uh, how everyone in my cohort interacts with these different styles and methods and kind of what we gain um, differently from each of these workshops. And I think they've all worked um, in different ways, but we haven't had a workshop where I felt, oh, this is just the professor being really prescriptive with how this is supposed to go, or this writer is not allowed to be understood. Because I mean, previous uh, criticisms of earlier workshop models were always that, oh, this writer has to be silent. And then if other students don't understand, now they're going to get a, a very skewed critiquing process. And so the workshop models that we've been using um, in, in the program have allowed the writer a little bit more, well, a lot more freedom actually to express themselves and make sure they're not being misunderstood so the critique can come from the right places. So it's still creating a space where the critique is honest and coming from, oh, this is how I'm reading it as, as your peer, 
this is how it's coming across to me. This is where your writing is coming from. But with a little bit more, with more flexibility for the author being critiqued to express themselves, to voice their own process, it prevents you from being in a place where all of a sudden all the critiques are just about the very much the wrong thing. Yeah, right. Which is, you know, one of the pitfalls. If if the group doesn't understand the intentions of the writer and the writer's not allowed to speak, then you could just have 30 minutes of talking in the wrong direction about a piece and then it's not helpful at all or to anyone. Um, so you mentioned the importance of being in a program that's fully funded. According to the website, each student at Maryland receives tuition remission and a stipend of $20,000 a year. In return for the stipend, students in the program teach. How's that experience been for you? What kind of classes do you teach and have you enjoyed it? Yeah, so actually the stipend has gone up recently. I think it's like 25000 now, oh, great. Um, which is really nice. Um, it's gone up since I've been in the program, kind of to account for the inflation and everything else. But it's been really it's been really generous. It's enough for me to live on and not really worry about anything like that. I mean, I'm not saving anything, but at the same point, I'm also not going into debt over this. Um, but then as far as teaching, it's been really great. Uh, the first class I taught was an intro fiction workshop course. And so each week I would have the students read a short story and we'd discuss it. And then the second uh, day of class that week, we would uh, have a workshop day where we'd critique the stories they had submitted. Um, and so it was really great because it allowed me to be in charge of the workshop using what I had, you know, taken from the workshops I, I was in. And so I felt like it was, it was a great way to show me the application of what I was learning um, and kind of bring it to, to the classroom here, but also allowed me to think more about what I needed from workshop for myself, what I need to give to my cohort in general, like what is the most useful kind of critique? Because I could see that in these writers who are new to this method, like where they were stumbling, where they're having troubles. Um, and so it's really valuable experience. And I, I really enjoyed doing this. And I, and I hope I was a good teacher. I think I tried to, I tried uh, to like get a good selection of stories for them to think about. Um, and then I really tried to make workshop a place where it was comfortable for them to discuss, you know, stories. Um, and I, and for young writers or new writers, it's, it's really vulnerable, obviously, um, to be submitting something to a class of your peers you've only known for a short while um, and writing you haven't done much before. Um, and then last semester, so the first or so fall semester of my second year, um, I was a TA for an intro fiction course um, under Professor Scott. Um, and that was another very interesting experience because I hadn't been a TA before. And so uh, two, of the, two of the days he would lecture um, to the class of like 100 students. And then on Fridays, I would have two breakout discussion groups of 25 each. And in those discussion groups, we would further discuss the story. And so that was kind of another way of helping me to understand like what works as far as discussion goes. How do we make this class move forward? How do we make students come out of their shells more? Because some students can be really shy about discussing, especially in the group of a hundred, that was always really difficult. But when it come to, came to a smaller group is, it was really a great experience. Like seeing these students realize that, oh, their opinions their points of views on these stories are really valuable and really matter to each other and that they can have these discussions. So by the end of the semester, I was like, I was really glad to see all these students, some of them who are really quiet, be able to express themselves. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought up these different experiences you've had because, you know, a lot of these programs are funded through teaching positions, but these teaching positions are not created equal, right? I mean, yeah. you might be um, teaching your own class with your own curriculum, or you might be TAing in a class and just having breakout groups. You might be teaching comp, you might be teaching creative writing. There's lots of different directions this can go in. So it's important to ask those questions. If you get into a program, what, what does the teaching actually look like? And another thing that can be different is the workload, which I heard at the University of Maryland, they've recently reduced your workload. What was the change that was made? And, and do you think it's been positive? Oh, it's absolutely been positive. Um, originally, what it was, was the first semester, you don't teach at all. You take like a pedagogy course um, where you kind of learn a few processes for teaching. Although actually all of us in my cohort had some teaching experience in the past. And I think that was actually really valuable as we were applying to have that on our resumes, to have that. I think that was something that ever, like they all mentioned when we got in. Oh, we like that you taught before. Um, 
But then the second semester in your first year, you would teach one class, which I did. And then, so previously, then in your first semester of your second year, you taught two courses. The second semester in your second year, you would teach one. And then if you sit on for the third year, you would teach two each semester. Although by then it would be a bit more manageable because you were just working your thesis. But it meant that the first semester of second year was just a intense semester because you were taking, you know, literature course, you were working on your thesis, you were working in your workshop, um, you're doing a lot and then also teaching too. And so Kate, my roommate, who is a year above me, she like went through that. And so like pretty much every day she was just like, I'm dying, you know, because she was taking a lot of classes. She was having to teach multiple classes as well. And it was just so much work. Um, and so she was having trouble like focusing on her writing as much as she wanted to. And so she and a lot of the other students in that year kind of began talking about that more. And I think it was a lot of them pushing like the faculty and the administration to be like, Hey, we want to really focus on our writing here. And right now we don't feel like we can with this, with this schedule. And so they changed it. And so now the first year, there's no teaching at all. Um, you really focus just on kind of becoming part of the program, really focusing your writing, learning how to teach. I think they're going to be taking the pedagogy course the second semester instead of the first semester. And then by the time you get to your second year, you only teach one each semester, um, which is really nice. So for me, my first semester, my second year, it felt really great. Like I was TAing for this class and TAing is less work than teaching your own class. You have less control. And so I didn't enjoy as much because I liked, you know, deciding the stories I chose, even though the stories we did read for that class were really good. And I liked the workshop setting a bit more than just the straight up literature setting. And then next semester, I'll be teaching the workshop again. And then third year, you still do the two and two. But once again, you're only working your thesis. So you aren't just completely overloaded. So I think it's really great that they've allowed that because it still allows you to have the experience of teaching, which is so valuable. And it's something that the MFA gives you because when you get out of the program, you are now have the qualification to like, you know, take up teaching positions since the MFA is like that potentially terminal degree but you're not overloaded with work. Well, I think uh, the best way to change MFA programs for the better is for the students that are in the MFA programs to speak up when they think that something needs to be changed. It's easy to just like let it slide because you don't want to ruffle feathers. But yeah. if you know you can get with your cohort and, and you're all in agreement that something could be improved, bringing that up to your pref- professors, hopefully they're open to it and will support you. And I love the fact that the University of Maryland – is not only willing to reduce your all's workload, but also increase your pay. That sounds like a pretty good deal. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Well, before we go, I want to give you the last word here. What is one way in which the MFA experience has been different for better or for worse from your expectations when applying? Yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking about. Um, And it's, it's, it's strange because in so many ways, I didn't even know what to think about it. I was just like, it's going to be magical. Like, it's going to be like just this magic thing. And in some ways it kind of is because I've just been so much more productive than I was for so many years. And it was just really validating as well, of course, to get into the program that I had uh, tried so many times to get into. And I, you know, put so much work into, so much time into. So the validation itself was just a magical experience and then coming here just being surrounded by other writers and who also are in this pretty similar place to me in their writing lives has been really great but then like the unexpected part of it is it's also just kind of another thing that you're doing like once you're here you're just kind of doing it so it's kind of magical in a way like I have really enjoyed being here I've really enjoyed being back in the school setting after kind of so long away um but yeah, it's once again, you're kind of just like back in school. You're just taking classes. You're like hanging out with your professors. You're just saying, hey, I'm going to school. And you're like 30 and you're just like, I'm in school again. But so <laughs> it's that mix of kind of magic and kind of just very normal. Um, and so I guess those are sort of the kind of mixed expectations I had for it. Well, Edward, thank you so much for stopping by. I feel like there's been all kinds of good information and insights that you've shared with us. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This is fun.